Our final speaker tonight before our question and answer session is Dr. Kimberly Vera. She is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. She earned her MD degree at the University of Tennessee, another UT grad school of medicine, and her master of science in clinical investigation at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. She was chief resident of pediatrics at John Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Vera is board certified in both pediatrics and pediatric cardiology. She testified like uh, Ellison at Senator Drew Dickerson's uh, hearings on medical cannabis in December before the Senate Health Committee. Her remarks were among the most powerful and uh, moving that I've ever heard. We welcome her tonight. Good evening. Thank you, Paul, for that, that nice introduction. Um, tonight, I'm going to review how cannabis acts on the body and share with you some of the most studied medical uses of cannabis. And at the end, I will share with you how an ultra-conservative pediatrician became interested in this topic. Cannabis has been used therapeutically as far back as 2800 BC. In the United States, <clears throat> cannabis was formally placed on the pharmacopoeia in 1854, and by 1900, cannabis was the third leading active ingredient in medicines of the day made by pharmaceutical companies like um, Eli Lilly and Merck. When the Marijuana Tax Act abruptly halted the production and sale of cannabis in 1937, physicians in the U.S. were stunned, but they were forced to comply with the law. Cannabis research was almost non-existent until THC was isolated in the 1960s. And despite continued legal restriction, research has been steadily increasing in the past few decades. The effects of cannabis are mediated by a host of cannabinoids that are produced by the plant. There are dozens of cannabinoids, but the most well-known are THC and CBD. Cannabinoids act on the human body through the endocannabinoid system. Each cannabinoid has a set of slightly unique but overlapping effects that produce an overall, an overall effect that is greater and different than each cannabinoid in isolation. This effect is called the entourage effect, and it is the reason that THC isolates like Marinol do not have the same effect as whole cannabis extracts. For example, CBD has been shown to lessen the intoxicating and sedating effects of THC while synergistically increasing the beneficial effects like the anti-inflammatory properties. Investigators at the University of Milan showed that administration of isolated THC or isolated CBD provided limited pain relief when compared to the administration of whole plant extracts. The endocannabinoid system was discovered in the 1990s and has been the focus of intensive research since that time. There are two receptors in the human body, CB1 and CB2. These receptors are found in numerous organ systems throughout the body. However, CB1 is found most extensively in the central and the peripheral nervous system, while CB2 is found most extensively in the immune cells of the body. The human body produces two known endogenous cannabinoids. They are called 2-AG, and anandamide. The endocannabinoid system is now known to be a critical regulatory system throughout the body. The use of cannabis in chronic pain, especially neuropathic pain, has been extensively researched in both the preclinical and clinical realms. On a cellular level, the endocannabinoid system is one of the key systems that regulate pain in the human body. Stimulation of the CB1 receptor inhibits transduction of peripheral noxious stimuli to the central nervous system on multiple levels. It also acts on the frontal limbic brain circuits which are involved in the negative emotional aspects around pain. Dozens of high quality clinical studies have repeatedly demonstrated efficacy and safety in patients with neuropathic pain. Two randomized controlled clinical trials have shown that smoking cannabis reduces pain related to HIV by more than 30% when compared to placebo. In 2013, another randomized controlled trial showed that vaporized cannabis of low-dose THC provided a significant decrease in neuropathic pain with no significant neurocognitive side effects. In 2015, another trial demonstrated vaporized cannabis provides significant reductions in patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. It is important to note that chronic pain patients are often the one forced to use opioids to manage their pain, and thus are the population at greatest risk for opioid overdose death. Cannabis is an attractive alternative which cannot cause overdose death. 
Both the Journal of the American Medical Association and the National Bureau of Economic Research publish studies demonstrating that states with medical marijuana laws have 25% fewer opioid overdose deaths. Cannabis has also been studied in numerous neurodegenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. There are several clinical trials demonstrating cannabis decreases spasticity, pain, and incontinence in patients with multiple sclerosis. There are two preclinical trials that show that cannabinoid administration slows the progression of multiple sclerosis in animal models. Investigators in Tel Aviv studied patients with Parkinson's disease and showed that tremor, rigidity, and slowness of movement significantly improved after inhaling cannabis. Other Parkinson's studies have shown that CBD reduces a sleep disorder found in Parkinson's patients and mitigates the psychosis which can sometimes be associated with the disease. Clinical trials in Alzheimer's patients showed that cannabinoids reduce agitation and stimulate weight gain. There are several preclinical trials in animal models of Alzheimer's that show that cannabinoids prevent the progression of the disease. Investigators in California have reported that THC inhibits the enzyme responsible for the aggregation of amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's. Cannabis has also been found to be helpful in autoimmune disease, like Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Cannabis has been shown to decrease the symptoms of Crohn's disease, resulting in significantly decreased use of other Crohn's medications and significantly decreased number of surgeries. This trial indicates that cannabis not only improves symptoms, but appears to alter the disease course. A second placebo-controlled trial showed that almost half the patients with treat, almost half of patients with a treatment-resistant form of Crohn's disease had decreased symptoms and nearly half entered remission on cannabis treatment. There are two clinical studies in rheumatoid arthritis that show that cannabis improves pain with movement, pain with rest, and inflammation. Preclinical data suggests that cannabinoids can prevent the progression of joint damage in rheumatoid arthritis. Cannabis has also been th found to be therapeutic in Tourette syndrome, epilepsy, PTSD, and cancer. One could talk for several hours about the numerous indications and their scientific support, but it is clear that there is overwhelming evidence that cannabis has a definitive therapeutic effect and often in diseases that have suboptimal treatments in mainstream medicine. So why am I standing here, well outside my comfort zone, speaking to you tonight about a very useful therapeutic medicine, but not one that I ever anticipate using in my pediatric cardiology practice? It's because more dear to my heart than my role as a doctor is my role as a wife and as a mother. I fell in love with my husband at the age of 13. We married when I was in medical school and went on to have two amazing sons together. He was the primary caretaker of our sons at home while I worked in the hospital. Several years ago, my husband went in to have a routine root canal. As soon as the lidocaine wore off, it became apparent that something was very wrong. He had excruciating pain in his lower right jaw. The narcotic pain medicine he was prescribed did nothing for the searing pain. The dentist saw him repeatedly and couldn't find a problem. A few days later, the searing, searing pain began in his upper jaw as well. At that point, it became clear that this was more than a dental issue. I drove him to the emergency room, desperate to get an answer and get him out of pain. After two large doses of IV narcotics, he was still writhing in the stretcher in pain. A neurologist was called in for an emergent evaluation and confirmed the diagnosis. My husband had trigeminal neuralgia. Trigeminal neuralgia is a neurologic disease which causes crushing, devastating neuropathic pain in the face. Typically, a sensory nerve sends a signal to the brain which causes pain when there is some type of tissue destruction. Neuropathic pain occurs when there is no tissue destruction, but an inherent malfunction of the nerve causes it to send pain signals to the brain. Narcotic pain medicine is only minimally helpful. There are numerous types of neuropathic pain syndromes, including those associated with diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and HIV. They are notoriously hard to treat with current medical regimens. Trigeminal neuralgia is one of the most devastating neuropathic pain syndromes. It has been repeatedly described as the most painful condition known to mankind. The pain is so severe that it is frequently called the suicide disease. 50% of patients kill themselves within two years, 
because the pain is so overwhelming and difficult to control. My husband has a disease for which there is no cure. It will not kill him, but it may drive him to kill himself. My husband was sent home with two types of seizure medicines to try to control his pain. The next two weeks were nightmarish. He would scream uncontrollably and would also merely pass out from the agony. I missed numerous work days because he was in too much pain to care for himself, and I was legitimately afraid he was going to kill himself. My older son was in tears most days, seeing my, his father in, that, in his state. To see someone you love in that kind of agony for days on end without anything to make them comfortable is torture. Trigeminal neuralgia had imprisoned my entire family. Finally, after numerous dose escalations, the seizure medicines took him out of the agonizing pain. However, he continued with daily pain spikes and would have exacerbations which would again cause days of agony. He was referred to a neurosurgeon as there is a surgery which can help some patients. We were devastated when the neurosurgeon told us he did not feel the surgery would help my husband. I sent his scans to other surgeons and neuroradiologists and received the same answer. We continued to live with a beast of trigeminal neuralgia using very high doses of seizure medicines. The medicine causes him to be very dizzy and mentally foggy. We had to hire a nanny as my husband could no longer care for our sons. Even more concerning is the list of potentially lethal side effects from his medicines. He's at risk for liver, for liver failure and bone marrow failure, just to name a few. His pain control is still far from complete and he still has severe exacerbations, which cause terror to my husband, myself, and my children. We had come to the end of what conventional medicine could do. It is a very lonely and scary place to be. It was disorienting for me as a physician, as I had always had an inherent trust that conventional medicine had all the answers. There are online support groups for patients who are in the same position as my husband. Desperation leads you to consider things you would never have done before. Numerous patients, numerous patients in states with legal medical cannabis who suffered from trigeminal neuralgia spoke to my husband about the immense benefit they had had using medical cannabis to treat their pain. About the same time, my older son was invited to Barcelona playing to, to play soccer. This was, of course, a huge opportunity for him, but we were deeply concerned about traveling out of the country with my sick husband. We discovered that cannabis was legal in Barcelona and took the risk of bringing him so we could try this potential therapy. The results of cannabis on my husband's pain was tremendous. He had no pain for the 10 days he was in Barcelona using cannabis. We were even able to decrease the doses of his seizure medicine significantly, and he was still out of pain for the first time in two years. He was back to his alert and interactive self. He was in no way stoned or lethargic. He was able to watch every bit of my son's soccer, and he got to participate in all the usual tourist activities. My husband was back. My son had his father back. It was a miracle, but a short-lived one, because our home is not Barcelona. Our home is Tennessee. It is critically important to appreciate that my husband is not the only one intensely suffering from not having access to medical marijuana. There are thousands of patients <clears throat> suffering right now and thousands more sons, daughters, and spouses who are in deep emotional pain watching their loved ones suffer. Scientific studies are very important, but we should never lose sight of the fact that we are talking about individual human beings with real pain and real disability. Each day that goes by without access to medical cannabis is another day of their lives missed because they're too sick to leave their beds. Another child soccer game missed, another family party missed, another school concert missed. 24 states have acted on the scientific evidence and compassionately legalized medical cannabis. I pray every day that Tennessee is the next so my children can have their father back once again. Thank you.